Uh, so I'm Mike Roach from the Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management. Um, and so I'll share with you today some research, actually some preliminary research or results from two research studies I'm working on. But first I just want to say that uh, I joined Cornell about a year and a half ago, so this is my second year here. And, and um, in coming here, you know, Diane and the rest of the CIA team really welcomed me to this community. So they, this team had already been formed and they were in their second year. And so for me this was really great because it was a, it allowed me to have an intellectual and academic community to start off with. Uh, and, and it led to a lot of uh, different research collaborations, so I'll present some results today on a project uh, Diane and I are working on, uh, and then Jack and Josh and I are also working on stuff around uh, different kinds of entrepreneurial identities and creativity and how, uh, how that, uh, you know, priming people to think of themselves as different types of entrepreneurs actually leads to different types of uh, areas of entrepreneur or different uh, levels of creativity. So what I'm going to present today is actually a research that's uh, based on two different studies I have that's largely in the space of, of university entrepreneurship. And by university entrepreneurship, the way I think about that is really, it's about um, the commercialization of scientific research research, largely coming out of university research labs um, through new ventures. And so there's lots of different ways that university research can be commercialized. One is through licensing to established companies, but more commonly we see a lot of it being commercialized through these startups. Um, it's often based on this research, but it doesn't have to be necessarily. It can also be based on um, just the scientific ex expertise of some of the faculty or graduate students who are working on, on uh, these ventures. Um, and this is thought to be a very critical vehicle for bringing these commercial, for bringing these research discoveries to the, the commercial sector. And so we're talking about uh, companies that are trying to commercialize drugs and medical devices, uh, electronics, uh, and things in, um, in uh, material science as well, and trying to bring these to the market. And the reason we care about this is because there's a lot of interest in a bit the impact of these technologies, not only on society, but also some of the broader economic uh, returns. So the federal government invests billions of dollars every year in university research, and they want to see some of the bigger returns to that. Part of that is through publications and the disclosure of this, uh, the knowledge in the academic community, but another part is actually trying to get these products out into society and try to benefit. Also, it's an important career pathway for science and engineering uh, graduates, and that's another area that I, that I research, and that's where this, uh, this research kind of brings these two areas together, and also can be an engine of economic uh, growth for in regions or also nationally that really can attract financial capital as well as employment growth. Uh, and part of what stimulated this research um, was, as, as a graduate student at Duke, I went to this conference that was on campus around university entrepreneurship. And so there's a lot of debate from venture capitalists and, and faculty about some of these, these uh, discoveries. And one of the, somebody in the audience got up and said, you know, why aren't we trying to make all faculty entrepreneurs? If they have some kind of discovery, why don't we teach them how to start companies? And I thought, is that really the right way to do this, right? I mean, these faculty are good at doing research. They're not, maybe not the best at actually thinking of you know, the commercial potential of their, of their ideas, so who's really the right people to do that? How do we go about doing this? And how do we try to encourage this research, or encourage this activity on university campuses? And so what I'm going to present today is, again, just really more of a phenomenon-driven kind of descriptive uh, approach that looks at two aspects of this. The first is actually looking at uh, the encouragement of entrepreneurship uh, at university campuses. And so, um, and this is, again, encouragement of more uh, scientific type of entrepreneurship. And so there's a lot of different programs. We have you know, courses that are offered at, the, at, at Johnson, at Dyson, in engineering, at ILR. Um, there's a number of programs on campus to try to facilitate this, like the McGovern Center. And so part of this is, you know, if we encourage this entrepreneurship, the idea is that we're going to stimulate more uh, companies. We're going to encourage more people to work in these, in, in these startups. And so there's a, these two different kind of tensions here, though. So on the one hand, we believe that if we encourage this, we're going to see some greater outputs. We're going to see more companies. We're going to see more um, people working in this. Great economic development. On the other hand, there's a lot of faculty in particular who are really concerned about what this might do to the academic research enterprise. Are we going to start to see research agendas shifting over to commercial uh, projects with commercial objectives instead of basic research? Are we going to see you know, graduate students not wanting to become faculty and going on and starting companies? And so there's a lot of tension here. And if you talk with people in these different labs, you'll hear some faculty uh, say, you know, in our lab or in our department, you know, this kind of activity is not really encouraged, but we need to change some of these attitudes. And so a lot of this is based on anecdote. There's a lot of stories out there, but there's not a lot of real data, especially at the university level, to try to understand to what extent is entrepreneurship encouraged and what might be some of the, the, the correlates of that. 
Okay, and so what, and this has a lot of implications for both federal and university policies in terms of how much funding should we be giving to different programs, uh, what kind of uh, programs should we have on campuses to try to facilitate and encourage this. And so what I'm going to present here first is just some data from a large uh, national survey that a colleague at uh, Georgia Tech, Henry Sauerman, and I have done on PhD students and their career choices. And so this is a very broad survey, but we're going to try to explore some variation in the extent to which uh, entrepreneurship is encouraged across different fields of science and engineering and see how that's actually related with their research activities, their commercial activities, and their career outcomes. Okay, and see what kind, you know, do we find some evidence that really kind of supports some of the, the, the kind of the beliefs that are out there. Um, so first of all, this is just to describe for just a few fields, and we have a lot more fields in this, these, these general patterns. And so this is based on a survey question of to what extent is a career in a, in a startup encouraged or discouraged in your lab? And it's on a five-point scale that goes from strongly encouraged to strongly discouraged. And so what we have here in these blue are just the share of PhDs in these fields that report that they're in their lab that working in a startup is either strongly encouraged or, or encouraged. This gray area here is the ones who say kind of neither, and this is more of an ambivalent kind of area here. And the red is the ones who report that entrepreneurship is either discouraged or strongly discouraged in their lab. And so the way to think about this is, first of all, these, the ones at the extremes, the red and the blue, are really just um, the, the, the share of PhDs for which these types of careers are more explicitly stated in their lab, is the way at least that I think of it. And this is where it's just maybe not as clearly stated. But the, the couple of takeaways from this is, are, are, are as follows. So one is just, as you might expect, there's a lot of variation across fields, where you have uh, biomedical engineering has the highest share, over 50% report that careers and startups are encouraged in their, in their field. Where you get down to some of the more basic uh, fundamental life sciences like microbiology, cellular uh, and molecular biology, and neuroscience, there's a much smaller share where it's encouraged, but also we see a not that, not a terribly large share where it's openly discouraged. So one of the takeaways from this is not just the variation across fields, but more importantly that across all these fields, we see that entrepreneurship is more often encouraged within a lot of these labs than discouraged, which goes against some of the kind of beliefs that you know, academics are really kind of openly discouraging a lot of entrepreneurial activity. Okay? Um, so that's kind of one of the things. And so what we'll look at now is among, these, uh, among the PhDs who are in labs that either encourage um, entrepreneurship here are kind of lumping these other two together. What do we see in terms of their research activities, their, their invention disclosure activities, and then more importantly, their career choices, and see if there's some kind of relationship here. So one is actually, what is the relationship between this and, and uh, uh, research activities? So one of the big concerns along in university research uh, is, uh, is that if we encourage um, entrepreneurship, we might actually undermine the, the fundamental research process. We might see less basic research activity. We might see more commercial research activity. And so what we see here, though, is this is just kind of summing these up into these broader fields, is that PhDs in the labs that encourage, uh, or they're in labs that encourage entrepreneurship, they perform about the same amount of basic research as PhDs in labs that don't um, encourage entrepreneurship. So I'm not saying that, that encouraging entrepreneurship doesn't have any kind of, you know, doesn't um, uh, uh, lead to lower levels of basic research. But what we can just say is that there's really no difference between labs that are encourage research and labs that don't. I'm sorry, they encourage entrepreneurship and don't encourage entrepreneurship in terms of the basic research activities. And what we might expect is if, there, if this concern were, had some uh, basis, that th these people would be doing less re basic research, right? So if your labs are encouraging, you might see lower levels. At the same time, if we look at invention disclosures, we see that um, PhDs, even across these fields that are in labs that encourage uh, entrepreneurship, have higher rates of invention disclosures than those that um, are in labs that don't encourage um, entrepreneurship. Now, that, do, that may be that actually labs that have more invention, inventions and discoveries to actually disclose are more likely to encourage entrepreneurship, so we can't really infer any kind of causal direction here. But it's interesting to just see these patterns that there's really not much evidence to support these kind of concerns about encouraging entrepreneurship might undermine uh, basic research activity. Um, but there is some evidence to suggest that encouraging uh, entrepreneurship might be associated with higher levels of invention disclosures, which is one of the, the kind of the outcomes we want to see. 
Um, also, we're looking at career preferences. And so one, another concern is whether if you encourage entrepreneurship, are you kind of undermining the long-term uh, scientific workforce that's going to be going into uh, universities and, and being uh, academics. And so here what we have is um, just the reports on how attractive is a university faculty career across different fields for um, uh, PhDs that are in labs that encourage entrepreneurship on the bottom and those on the top. And so the dark blue is that a faculty career is, is uh, extremely attractive uh, and this light blue is that it is attractive. So these are kind of the high ends. And what you see is that across these uh, different fields, there's really no difference. So encouraging entrepreneurship doesn't make an academic career less attractive is the way to take that. Another thing to notice is that even across these fields, we see pretty similar rates in terms of the share of, of PhD students who are attracted to, um, to faculty careers. What's interesting though is if we look at how attractive are startup careers, we see bigger differences. So we see across these fields that the bottom groups here, um, these are PhDs who are in labs that actually encourage entrepreneurship. We see much higher share of them who are interested in working in startups. So one of the takeaways here is that encouraging entrepreneurship may not really undermine kind of the interest in going and working as a faculty member, but it might encourage these PhDs to want to work in startups. And that might help grow some of the scientific workforce that can go and work in startups, or even encourage them to start companies if they have the, um, you know, discovers coming out of their labs. So some of the key uh, you know, findings of this, the big idea is that really, you know, entrepreneurship is, is, is pretty widely encouraged, actually, across university uh, labs, um, which is something that really hasn't been shown before. Uh, but there's no evidence that this encouragement dampens the basic research or faculty career preferences or other activities like that. But also some evidence that encouraging it is associated with, with greater activities. Again, I'm not going to make any causal inferences there, but that's, uh, the patterns are suggestive of that. Uh, and there's a lot of implications for how do we uh, try to, um, you know, whether we should encourage entrepreneurship on campuses or not, how do we form programs, um, and also who's likely to work in some of these startups. And so just in the interest of time, I'm going to jump into the, the other studies with Diane. And this is very preliminary research. But what we're looking at here is, okay, now that we've looked at the encouragement of entrepreneurship, the next thing is what, who's going on and starting these companies. And so what we have here is a study where we're looking at the founding teams uh, using data from four universities on invention disclosures and startup licenses. And so this is a pretty, it's been a very time intensive uh, project. We have over a thousand companies. And what we're doing is trying to find, you know, who are the inventors who are involved on these discoveries that are being licensed, and then which of them are going on um, and starting companies. What are your four universities? Um, Stanford, MIT, Caltech, and Berkeley. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so we have this detailed data. So all I'm going to show here is just some of these patterns. And the reason we care about this is that much of the research on academic entrepreneurship is focused on faculty. They look at faculty uh, academics. And largely, these faculty don't go on and play operational roles. And so just real quickly, just to show you, this is just a subsample from one of the universities. And what it shows is that this is of all the inventors, what's their role in the companies? And so we see here that um, uh, this is all the graduate students, that there's a much larger number of, of, the, the, of inventors who go on and take an operational role, like a CTO or a VP of, of engineering, are graduate students. A small number of assistant professors, zero full professors. And this is one of the it's one of the more prominent universities in the sample. But you can see that most of the time, the, the professors are taking on advisory roles, not operational roles. Okay, so even though they are co-founders, they're not the ones actually working full time on this company. Um, and then the second thing to look at is just what are the types of founding teams. And so this tries to understand what's the general composition of the founding teams. And so what we have here is that the blue share up here, the 6%, are founding teams that are all just all, of them, all the top management are inventors. Here we have some that are hybrid between uh, inventors and uh, business people from outside of the invention team. Over here we have ones that are mostly business people with inventors as employees in the company. And then the yellow is just ones where the entire team is external to the invention disclosure team. So the reason we care about whether inventors are involved or not is that there's very complicated knowledge that's associated with these discoveries. And having somebody from the, the research team involved can uh, really help with the transfer of that knowledge and the development of the technology. And so what we're looking at moving forward is trying to develop some typologies of different types of, of uh, inventor founders uh, and different types of founding teams and seeing how that relates with different stages of the company's uh, development in terms of what kind of funding do they get versus you know, SBIR versus versus uh, VC, um, and then other stages of the development and success of the company. Okay, so that kind of just gives you a real quick overview of some of the, uh, of the research here. But I think what's really interesting about this research in particular is that you know, most of the academic research on university 
entrepreneurship really focuses on the faculty as the founders. And what we show in this is providing some hard data that you know, very few of the people who are actually working full time in these companies are the faculty. And so this has a lot of implications for programs at universities again. So who should we be targeting in terms of training and preparing them to start companies? How should we be structuring licenses, um, licensing deals? And, and other sources of funding. So there's a lot of attention that's directed towards the faculty for starting these companies and, and running the companies, but they're not the ones doing it. And so this is, hopefully this has some implications for that, as well as how to go about structuring some of these teams. Okay, thank, thank you. you.